Hello, welcome back to Happy Little Diodes. Today we're repairing another ZX Spectrum 48K. This one came from Slovenia, of all places, and it was a complete nightmare, but the solution in the end was extremely simple. I almost didn't even make the video, because it's such a simple solution, but it's all part of the process, and I think that's important to show. I've also repaired this recently for the local repair cafe. It's a classic cassette Walkman, and if you don't mind, I think I've deserved a moment to relax with my favourite music and my favourite book. We've had stuff sent to us from all over the world at Happy Little Diodes, but a ZX Spectrum from Slovenia? Definitely didn't expect that. It's a beautiful country, I've only been there once, but I would like to go back. And I love this machine which has arrived. Check it out, it's got so much character. It's got a rainbow Spectrum Apple sticker on it for some reason. The faceplate is all battered, which I love, and it has a reset switch at the back. Flipping it over and the story continues with all of these stickers. It's had some repairs or service mods at some point, and there are three anti-tamper stickers on there. Anyone's interested in cereals, this is the cereal. These two anti-tamper stickers are interesting, triangular ones, they seem to be a legit Sinclair service. It says guarantee in the German spelling, which is confirmed by the other sticker, which says Achtung, Kontrollplakette nicht entfernen, wichtig für ihren Garantieanspruch. In English, do not remove. Here's our Apple sticker, I don't know where that's come from, maybe some Apple boffins if you're in the comments can tell us. And a separate tiny little sticker that says bend back and peel, whatever that means. The faceplate is absolutely battered, I love that, it shows it's been used and I think it adds character. And the key mat appears to be worn as well at the edges, which means this machine has seen a lot of love and I'm excited to get it working again. Here's the custom reset switch at the back, I've got a feeling that that's not an official mod from Sinclair, we'll make sure that's working. There's two wires we can see through the back, they must be going to the reset switch. Anyway, enough waffle, let's open it up and see what we're faced with. All of the stickers are already damaged, so somebody's been in here since it was last serviced. That's either to fit the reset switch or to have a look at why it wasn't working. Let's have a look, there's going to be two ribbon cables in there, uh, they're not plugged in and they are looking crusty. And we have our mercifully long reset switches, so I can put the top half of the case down and remove them without tugging on anything, so to speak. We're going to need to remove the board completely from the case, and it does have its screw in the center there, so we'll remove that, and when I put it back in, I'm going to put a little plastic washer on so it doesn't cause any shorts. Here's a close-up of our reset switch. It seems to be working, mechanically at least. I don't see why that shouldn't be operational once we reattach it. It has been fitted with two resistors there, don't know if that's necessary and I'll probably just solder it directly to the capacitor because that's how it's done on the ZX Spectrum Plus machines. So removing that will allow us to work on the board without anything getting in our way. I'll remove these two resistors as well. You'll have to forgive me for using tweezers as snips, it's just a habit I've gotten into. No resistors were harmed in the making of this video. A quick look at the underside of the board before we go any further, and I can see it's had some RAM work done if that wasn't already given away by the socketed RAM chip on the top side. So we're going to go to resistance measurement mode on the fluke meter, and as is tradition we're going to measure the resistance between ground and the three voltage supply pins to one of these lower RAM chips in the bottom left. Doesn't matter which one we pick, they're all tied together. We're looking for them to be not close to zero, and they're all in the kilo ohms range, which is good news means we can probably power this up with a bench supply with a limited current and see what sort of current draw we're getting and then measure our voltages. So let's make sure the bench supply is set up correctly, it's at 9 volts. I've limited it to 760 milliamps, close enough. We'll plug it in and see what we get. It's drawing 600 milliamps, seems to be fairly normal, nothing too concerning. Flipping back to DC voltage measurements, going to measure the voltage between ground and those same three voltage supply pins to the lower RAM chips. Starting with the top left, we're looking for minus five volts, and that's intolerance. Bottom left, we're looking for plus 12, and that is intolerance. It's a bit off 11.7, but it is with intolerance according to the Sinclair Spectrum service manual. Bottom right should be five volts, and that also looks good to me. It's had a composite mod done, and they've just snipped the two wires from the modulator, which isn't the way I normally do it, 
and they seem to have used an unfolded paper clip to do the actual composite mod, so I'll remove that and I'll put a capacitor in place. But it will serve us now to show us what the video output's doing. Okay, we've got a black screen, or we'd call it black paper, and a white border. Seems like it's getting stuck in the memory test, and it has had memory issues before because one of the lower RAM chips has already been replaced. What I'm going to do is plug in a diagnostics ROM and that should easily tell us which RAM chip is causing the problem, if it is a RAM problem. So let's plug in the Dandinator and see what it tells us. That's what it looks like in the top right, I've plugged it in and we're getting this screen. Oh bollocks. This is the screen that comes up when there's no ROM chip telling the CPU what to do. So if you removed your ROM chip from the ZX Spectrum you'd get something like this. So it tells me that the diagnostic ROM is not able to run. Seems like the system is not giving up control of the buses to the external Dandinator device. That's an issue, it tells me that it's not a simple RAM problem, or it's unlikely to be, probably something with the CPU or the ROM chip. But first of all I'm going to try swapping the ULA. I have another board here with a similar ULA, I'm just going to swap them and see if we get the same fault. Mostly because it's a quick and easy test to do. You can see they're both 6 series ULAs, uh, built within about 20 weeks of each other. So let's pop it in there and see what we get on the video output when I plug it in. Alright, that's good. We're getting the same failure mode so it tells us that the ULA is probably not the problem. So let's start chasing ghosts. I got the nifty little oscilloscope out and started probing data lines and address lines. What I ended up finding was that the cast signal to the upper RAM was not moving at all. It was stuck high. You can see there that it's stuck at 4.2 volts. I would expect that signal to be very active on an idling ZX Spectrum. I'll show a comparison here on these nice little ceramic RAM chips in this issue 2 board and you can see it's very very active. So possibly we have an issue to do with the generation of the cast signal. So bringing up the ZX Spectrum issue 3B schematic, we can zoom into the very bottom right. This is where the cast signal is generated through this series of logic gates. You can see it's coming out on pin 6 of IC23 there. So I put the scope on pins 4 and 5. This is one of them, it's very active. And this is the other one, it's stuck high. Now at this point my brain turned into sludge and fell out of my head and I decided that there must be a problem with that gate because the output was stuck high. So cue hours of recording footage and explaining what exactly was going on here and replacing the chip that generates that signal. Just to explain why I'm an idiot, if one input to an OR gate is stuck high, the output will always be high, which was exactly what I measured. I replaced the chip that generates the cast signal, here it is, and I'm measuring that output and it's still stuck high, which is obviously what was always going to happen. So back to the schematic, back to the drawing board, zooming back into the bottom right here, let's have a look at the signals which feed that logic gate that generates the cast signal. Look at pins 4 and 5. One of them was held high, and I traced this back through, scoping everything, and I found that A15 was being held low, and that in turn was causing the cast signal to be held high. So here we are, I'm going to show you it. This is A15, or pin 10 of IC24, and it's just ground noise. So what could be causing A15 to be held low? Well, A15 is generated by the CPU up here. We know that CPUs tend to fail, so that's a likely suspect. The only other thing that it connects to is the logic gates down here, which we've already looked at, or the ULA, and we've already swapped out the ULA. So I don't think it's that. It could be the CPU or the logic chips. We can do a quick test to determine that. So what I'm going to do is desolder pin 10 of the logic chip. That's where A15 goes to. I'm using the desolder gun, which was kindly donated by Lee at Morph on making it. And you can see that I've isolated the pin from the joint. It's still pushed through the hole, I haven't had to bend the leg up, I've just isolated it from making that connection, and now the A15 is only connected to the CPU and the ULA, and we can see it's still just ground noise. So the CPU is our suspect. Or if you're interested with A15 desoldered from that logic chip, this is the failure mode that we get. It probably changes if I reset the system, let's have a look. Oh yeah, it's a bit more green now. Anyway, let's remove the CPU, but not before we resolder pin 10 of the logic chip, because I'm going to forget to do that if I don't do it now. Let's get the desolder gun out and get this CPU out. 
I had an absolute nightmare with this gun blocking up the other day until somebody gave me the great idea of unfolding a paperclip if you can't find the blockage removal tool and using that with some hot air to clear it out. Great idea. There's our CPU removed. I'm just inspecting it and I'm also cleaning up some of these little dags in the solder joint so I can get the socket in which I ran out of, I don't have a socket just now. So I'm going to leave the CPU out and I'm going to go and get on with some of the service work on this machine. When the CPU socket arrives, we can pop the CPU back in. So I'm going to change the capacitors out first, as well as doing the DC-DC mod, because this is an issue 3B spectrum. The DC-DC mod is going to improve the reliability of the power circuit. I find it really easy to do this job with the board upright in a vise, don't worry it's not too tight and it's closed around the modulator, not the PCB itself. Now with this being a 6 series ULA those are known to die, but this one is working and my decision is to give it a longer life by removing the socket so I can fit a heatsink on top. This is about 50-50 in the community if you think it's a good or a bad idea, but I think if you can do a good job removing the socket without damaging the PCB, it's best to put the heatsink on. Go ahead in the comments, let's open up this conversation, let me know what you think. I know the ULA is working in this case because I put it into another board and I tested it with a dandinator as well as testing audio tape loading, so everything's good with this ULA. My sockets have arrived for the CPU, so I'm going to put that in and get it soldered in place and pop in a new CPU. They've stopped making these by the way, not sure what that means for uh, ZX Spectrum repairs going into the future, but hey ho. Well, I plugged it in and I got the exact same failure mode, so I got the scope out and went searching again. And this time I found that A7 was being held low. So following the same diagnostic procedure as before, I've isolated the A7 pin on the ROM chip and it seemed to spring back to life. So it looks like the ROM chip is also a problem. By the way, here's the failure mode with A7 desoldered from the ROM chip if you're interested. Let's get the ROM chip out and put in a new one, see what happens then. That should be just about free. You should be able to remove it and have a little look underneath for any problems with the traces and with the joints. Everything seemed fine. So I plugged in the dandinator because, you know, with that chip removed, it should be able to then run a diagnostic ROM on an external interface. But it still didn't bloody work. So I went digging and I found that the chip enable signal going to the ROM chip was trying to oscillate. It should just be held high by the external interface, but it was trying to oscillate. So I think that the system was still not giving up control properly. And I traced that signal all over the shop, pulling components up, looking for some issue with that particular signal. And this was just a rabbit hole that I went down because we're in the business of going down rabbit holes with this repair. The next step of desperation was to get the logic analyzer out and take a look at what the data bus is doing. You might notice I'm using a special interface here between the ZX Spectrum and the logic analyzer. This is a little project I've been working on in KiCad just to get to grips with using the software and I'm really enjoying it. This is riddled with errors as I found when the boards arrived. I'm going to make a much more detailed video reviewing the new logic analyzer and going through the process of getting this logic analyzer interface ordered. I've gone through this video sponsor's PCB way to get these prototypes made up. It's such an easy process even for newbies like me. I highly recommend going and checking them out and not being afraid of dipping your toe into PCB design. It's really fun and once you get past the first little obstacles you can do anything you want. So what was the data bus doing on this broken specy? Well, it appears that it was being held high. Every time the CPU does something, the instruction comes in at FF, and that is the same as what you would expect to see with no ROM chip plugged in. Just a floating data bus being pulled up high. Which, to be honest, was kind of cool to see it working. Um, I'm, I'm kind of enjoying using this logic analyzer. I'm excited to get this interface working a bit better. Another thing I noticed with a logic analyzer plugged in, and this is a complete tangent by the way, now to do with the repair, but I saw errors cropping up every 4,000-ish samples. This is at 7 megahertz, by the way. You can see them there, the little purple circles, and the errors are when the decoders can't quite figure out what's going on because the timing of the signals isn't coming in as it expects. 
Now I also noticed that when I select 7 MHz, which is the pixel clock frequency, which is double the CPU clock frequency, it tells me there'll be a jitter of 2.041%. I don't really know if this is related to the errors that I'm seeing, maybe you can educate me in the comments. Doing the calculations, I would say about 4% of the samples that were taken were throwing up errors. That's double 2%, maybe it's something to do with it. I don't know, help me out. Back to the repair anyway, I threw in a diagnostic ROM chip internally and I literally said, this isn't going to work. And then, wow, get the camera on the screen, it's actually running. It ran the diagnostic program and it told me there was a lower RAM fault. You can already see that from the colours and these lines. And it says that IC7 is at fault. Can it be? Is it just a lower RAM fault after all of that? Could that really be causing the problems that we were seeing? Well. IC7 is already socketed, so what you're seeing now in real time is the grand total amount of work which was required to fix this machine, never mind the hours and hours that I've just consolidated into the last 14 and a half minutes. Okay, it's taken more than a few seconds because this socket's a bit weird. That's about the sum total of the difficulties that I would have had if I'd have focused on this socketed RAM chip in the first place. There, it's in. Now let's see what happens. It's working perfectly. Bloody hell. I don't really know what the lesson there is. Is the lesson to just always try replacing the socketed chips, you know, regardless of where your diagnostic process is taking you, because that certainly would have saved a lot of time in this case. So I guess it's time to start putting back in the original components that I'd swapped out, such as the Z80 and the ROM chip, even the voltage regulator, I put in a switching one just so I could work on the board and probe around a lot more easily without having to have the heatsink attached. And what I found was, replacing every chip with its original component didn't lead to any more errors, so it was indeed only one lower RAM chip causing problems on this board. Oh well, let's get the remaining service tasks done, I'm going to stick a heatsink on the ULA, that was the reason we took the socket out, now we can fit this heatsink on and get the board back into the little rubber key 48k case. We also need to sort out this composite mod because I don't want to leave it with a nail attached, I'm going to replace it with a capacitor. So I'm going to try and remove it, although it's pretty much welded through that hole, it's all been a bit damaged in the process, I'm sure I'll be able to sort it out. What I'm doing here is putting a capacitor through the damaged joint and I'm going to extend the leg of it so I can solder it to a via a little bit further down the line. I'm going to put a bit of a heat shrink around the exposed leg and that should just about do us. So there's the enameled wire extending the positive leg of the capacitor, fitted it in place here, a little bit of heat shrink to protect it from ground, and everything's looking quite neat and pretty well salvaged. Let's put the lid back on. That pretty much only leaves the keyboard membrane. Fortunately, the glue on this faceplate has gone and it was very easy to lift off. This way we can remove the keyboard membrane, this crusty old thing will go in the bin, and in goes our shiny new one. Lovely. Now we just put the original rubber key mat back on. Oh, that's a bit dirty actually, isn't it? This isn't a refurb, it's a repair, but I don't mind cleaning it out because it looks pretty crusty. This is looking a lot neater now, I've given it a rinse under the tap and it once over with a toothbrush. We can put our manky old face split back on that I'm in love with. I've put um, double-sided tape around it after scraping off the old glue and everything is looking nice and lined up and in order. Before we put it back together, we need to reattach this reset switch. I couldn't bring myself to remove it, it's just too useful and it's been done too well. They even cut a slot out of the heatsink so it would fit. Fantastic. So there it is reattached, I haven't put those resistors back in place, I've just soldered it directly either side of the capacitor. Put it back together again, give it a test. Does the reset switch work? And yes, it does. It's quite hard to spot while in the Dandanator menu, but you can see that it's resetting. Fantastic. Well, let's stitch everything back up again, run some soak tests, and then get it back to Slovenia to the owner. So that's about it for this job. Check out the new Linktree link in the description. This will take you to Amazon where you can see some of the bits and bobs that I use that a few of you ask me about. Alright, see you next time. Cheers. Bye bye.